The Japanese American Nisei soldiers of World War II fought on the front lines in the name of freedom, while family and loved ones back home were detained in camps. The Nisei soldiers of the 442nd Regiment, who became known as the Purple Heart Battalion, would become the most decorated unit in U.S. military history. But at what price? In 1941, I was a student at Compton Junior College. And it was Sunday morning. I was doing homework in my little table. And I had the radio playing. And the announcer broke in and said, Pearl Harbor has been attacked. Following Japan's attack on Pearl Harbor, the Japanese American communities in the United States faced immediate scrutiny and were accused of loyalties to Japan. In the Japanese language, you have ichi, ni, san, shi, go, one, two, three, four, five. So ichi, issei, first generation. Nisei, that's me, second generation. Considering from Japan, first generation, second generation, my children are sansei, ichi, ni, san third generation, and their children are fourth, and so forth. Anti-Japanese sentiment in the United States grew. Propaganda emerged, which positioned the Japanese as sneaky and immoral, and accused Japanese Americans living in the U.S. of betraying their country. Most of the Issei parents, you can't blame them for having a lot of allegiance to Japan, their home country, because that's all they knew when they came from there. And when they came to the United States, they were not accepted. And the laws were passed to deny them from purchasing land and becoming citizens. Just two months after Pearl Harbor, President Franklin Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066, allowing for the formation of camps to confine over 100,000 Japanese and Japanese Americans. Many families lost property, savings, businesses, and keepsakes as they obeyed publicly posted commands to leave their lives behind and report to the authorities. We became prisoners of war in our own country. Just like that. Stripped of our citizenship. After being registered at temporary assembly centers, the detainees were sent to various camps around the country with some even given orders to assist in building the very fence they would be imprisoned behind. Conditions were difficult. The earth was barren, the living quarters cramped, and soldiers patrolled the fences with guns in hand. For instance, bathrooms with just a large room with commodes, one after the other, no partitions, just wide open, showers, Big room with just shower heads. Older Nisei, of course, had you know a lot of problems with privacy and all that. Despite these setbacks, the Japanese Americans developed the camps into productive communities, transforming the earth into fertile farmland, publishing newspapers, and establishing churches and recreational activities. The U.S. government circulated a loyalty questionnaire throughout the camps with two key questions whether the detainees would obey a military draft and if they would denounce loyalty to the Japanese empire. These questions deepened an already growing divide between the Issei, first-generation Japanese, and the American-born Nisei, or second generation. And the younger boys would volunteer. The older guys would pick them out and beat the crap out of them. So they had to get special guards to these homes for these boys that volunteered. In 1943, the Army opened enlistment opportunities for Japanese Americans, but only within segregated units. It was 1943 when we were finally allowed to join the military. So that's when I volunteered for the 442nd. The 1st Nisei Soldier Regiment, the 100th Battalion, was formed entirely of Nisei from Hawaii where a sizable Japanese-American population had prevented the formation of the same camps that dotted the mainland. The 100th Battalion was soon joined on the front lines of the European theater by the 442nd Regimental Combat Unit, comprised largely of volunteer Nisei soldiers from the Pacific States. 
Among other military campaigns, the 442nd are known for their liberation of the French city of Bruyere, as well as the rescue of the lost battalion. And we're about 50 miles from the German border. And they tell us we're going to take the city of Bruyere. Bruyere is a key city because the railroad comes through Bruyere and it's the feeder for the Western Front for the German Army. The 15th of October, we head out, heading toward Bruyere on the road. And all of a sudden, we get shots fired, artillery and rifle fire all over, scattered all over. And Shots aren't coming from the city, they're coming from the hills up above. So we have to get up into the, all these trees, the heavily forested hills. We never fought in trees before. So from October 15 to 23, it took eight days to clear the mountains, and then we could come down, clear the city, capture the rail line, and go forward. So on October 23, after eight days of vicious fighting, we get pulled off the line. We got a hot meal, a change of clothes. Didn't even have time to clean our weapons, and they told us we had to gear up and go again. General Dahlquist does not want to lose his battalion. That's the first battalion of the 141st Regiment of the 36th Division from Texas. He had sent the second battalion to try to rescue him. They got turned back. He had sent the 3rd Battalion of the 141st, and they got turned back. 442nd had just come off eight days of battle, but they're sitting there, so he said, you guys go get them. October 25 is the day we start out, and it's early winter, starting to rain. Well, it's miserably cold. You can't get equipment like tanks, jeeps up there because you're doing all the fighting in these hills. It's all manpower. But then we got shelled, we got knocked down by the German artillery, we couldn't go forward. Again, casualties are high. Two more days before the 442nd actually reached the lost group. Some 200 Nisei soldiers perished on top of hundreds of casualties in order to free the 211 remaining men of the lost battalion. Military intelligence schools established in the Presidio in San Francisco and at Camp Savage in Minnesota trained Japanese Americans in the Japanese language, interrogation techniques, and translation to aid in the war effort. These military intelligence service members were also key players in the occupation and reconstruction of Japan following the war. Groups such as the Friends and Family of Nisei Veterans continue to provide support for service members and their loved ones as they preserve memories and honor the sacrifices made by those lost in war. It was a sacrifice that the Nisei boys had to make. We made a tremendous change in the minds of the general public, you know, about who we were. We wouldn't be living here if we didn't do it.